This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. The following chapter is going to go through and revise leases. As well as revising leases, it's also going to go through and update your knowledge of what you've previously seen at F7 level to begin to look at not just the lessee's perspective of accounting for lease, but also the lessor's accounting perspective. Now, before we go any further and recap and introduce any new stuff, uh, just be aware the standard is going to change. So currently we are dealing with IS 17 and IS 17 is currently the examinable standard per the syllabus. So the P2 syllabus states categorically that leases IS 17 is the examinable standard. So all the knowledge that we talk about here is what you need to know. However, to help you with the current issues question, as we go along through this chapter, we will also go through as well and update you on what the changes are going to be as we move from the current IS 17 leases standard into the new IFRS 16 leases standard. You could still get examined on the IFRS 16 element, but if it were to be examined, it would be examined as part of the current issues question in question number four. The actual leases and IS 17 will be part of the question one within the group accounts question, whereby maybe the parent has some form of lease arrangement, or maybe in question two or question three, where it will ask you to go through there and discuss the concepts of leasing and how it applies to any specialized scenario that there may be within the question. So let's just go through and have a look and recap what we have and what we understand with regards to leases. So when we have leases, there are two parties. First of all, there is the lessor. Remember, the lessor is the person that legally owns the asset. It is their asset that they have gone through there and bought. But what they go through and do is that they rent out the asset, don't they, for somebody else to use. And that person who uses and rents the asset it is the lessee. Yeah, The lessee is the person who uses that asset. And they use that asset in return for rental payments. So the lessee will go through there and make payments to the lessor, either in advance, so they are payments that are at the start of the lease period, or they will be made in arrears, which is at the end of the lease period. Now, when you went through and looked at this from an F7 perspective, the focus was looking at it from the lessee's perspective, wasn't it? And what we went through and did there is we were able to account for, was it first of all a finance lease, whereby the substance was very much there of ownership, wasn't it? So we went through there and recorded the property, plant and equipment on the lessee's book, even though legally we did not own it. And we also went through there, didn't we, and set up a payable in the lessee's books because in substance we were financing that lease via a loan weren't we and then once we had the loan and the property plant and equipment the property plant and equipment was depreciated wasn't it and then the payable or the lease liability we had to incur interest using the actuarial method and then we also had to deal with those payments wasn't it that were in arrears and in advance and there were all sorts of various challenges that you had there within the f7 exam wasn't it as well as looking at the finance lease from the lessee's perspective, we also went through there and looked at the operating lease, whereby the substance was essentially the same as the legal form, wasn't it? In that we went through there and we had in substance no ownership, so we didn't recognise an asset or a lease liability, and we just recognised the lease payment on a straight line basis over the life of the lease. That's something now where we begin to introduce a little bit in terms of your current issues. I don't want to touch upon it too much because we will see it right at the end of the material uh, when we begin to go through and look at current issues. But if you look at an operating lease, we just recognise the lease payment straight line over the life of the lease, don't we? There is no liability that is created. Well, if you think about the definition of a liability, it's a present obligation as a result of a past event that gives rise to an outflow of economic benefit, isn't it? Well, if we've signed a lease agreement, that's the past event that gives rise to an obligation because over the next however many months it may be, we are going to have to go through that and make those rental payments that we have agreed to make. But where's the liability? There is no liability. So that's one of the issues that you have with regards to this current standard and IS 17. 
on the operating leases, there is no liability that is recognised. Likewise, there's no asset. Now, even though it may be a short period that we have an operating lease for, we still have control of that asset, don't we, for that particular length of time. And if we have control of an asset, then maybe if we can measure the value of the asset reliably and there are probable inflow of economic benefits, then when we should be recognising that asset in the financial statements and under an operating lease, we don't. So, so there are issues surrounding the current standard. But as I said, I don't want to get too involved with those just at this point in time. Key bit is that F7, you accounted for a finance lease and an operating lease from the lessee's perspective. Yeah, that sound familiar? Hopefully, because what we have to look at now is the lessor, isn't it? And we're on that far side. Yeah, from the lessor's perspective, the person who legally owns the asset, we now need to look at the accounting as well. You panic, you think, oh no, that's going to be horrendously difficult. It's not as bad as what you actually went through there and thought. What you need to just go through and do there is just reverse the entries. So we still have a finance lease and we still have an operating lease. Uh, so with the finance lease, the lessee recorded the asset and a liability. So from the lessor's perspective, they need to de-recognise that asset and record a receivable for the amounts that they are going to receive. Instead of recording interest expense, they're going to have an interest income, aren't they? And there'll be no depreciation because the asset has been removed from the financial statements. If it's an operating lease, then what we have there is that instead of having the asset and the liability, what we're going to go through and do now with regards to my operating lease as opposed to your finance lease is that you are going to go through there now and recognise the cash receipts on a straight line basis over the life of the lease. So instead of having an expense in the lessee's books, you have income within the lessor's books. So essentially, we're just flipping around all of the debits and all of the credits. There are some subtle differences, but I think it's key that you appreciate the lessee's accounting first from F7 before we then go through and start to think about things and how they are then dealt with in P2 from the lessor's perspective. Again, from a current issues perspective and thinking about IFRS 16, just to give you a bit of an idea, the lessee accounting treatment is going to change. I'm not going to talk about what the changes are going to be, but that is going to change. Uh, nothing ridiculous in terms of the changes, but there are some subtle changes that will take place. And then with regards to the lessor, there are no changes that take place. So we still talk about a finance lease. We still talk about an operating lease for the lessor. We still account for it in exactly the same way as what we did under IS-17. So what you learn in these coming videos is going to be relevant, not just for IS-17, but also for IFRS-16. So it's definitely worthwhile spending the time making sure that you understand things, not just from the lessee's perspective, but from the lessor's perspective, particularly going forward into the future. So what we need to go through and do, before we start talking about things from the lessee's and the lessor's perspective, uh, let's go through there and think about when we have a finance lease. So remember, we have a finance lease, don't we? If the risks and rewards are transferred to the lessee. So the person who uses the asset, if they have the risks and rewards of ownership, then it's a finance lease. If the lessee does not have the risks and rewards of ownership, then quite simply, it's not a finance lease. So it must be an excellent, an operating lease, isn't it? So to make the judgment, we have to look at it from the lessee's perspective and determine whether or not they have the risks and rewards of ownership. But what do we mean by having the risks and rewards of ownership? Well, the main factors to go through and consider there within the standard, and again, a lot of these should be familiar from what you've seen previously in F7, is that the lease term represents the major part of the asset's life. Again, going back to the framework, you know, giving us the principles, it's all about judgment, isn't it? Okay, it's not rules-based like US rules. Yeah, IFRSs are all very subjective. So here we have the words, don't we? The major part. It doesn't specifically say how much. Yeah, but if you use the asset, for the majority or the major part of its life, then it will be a finance lease. Okay, Again, that lease term needs to consider any secondary lease periods for maybe any peppercorn rentals that you may pay. Uh, likewise, the other familiar one that you had from F7 was that if the present value of minimum lease payments represents substantially all of the asset's fair value. So again, uh, very subjective. What do we mean by substantially all? Okay, There's, there's no... 
numerical determination as to what percentage the present value minimum lease payments needs to be of that fair value. It is a judgment call, isn't it? The other factors that you can go through and consider, I suppose maybe a little bit more P2 orientated now, are uh, the ownership passes at the end of the lease term. Uh, so if there is an agreement whereby the asset becomes yours at the end of the lease, then you are going to use it, aren't you, for all of the asset's life. So therefore, it is a finance lease. Uh, if you have a peppercorn rental in the secondary period, so if you have the option to pay a very, very small rental in that secondary period, and the likelihood is that you would take up that peppercorn rental, then therefore it will be a finance lease. Likewise, if you have the option to purchase it at below the market value at the end of the lease, so we need to pay attention there to any fluctuations in the value of the asset uh, in terms of its market value and whether or not we are able to purchase it at significantly below that value at the end of the lease, because if we are, the likelihood is that we will purchase it and therefore get all the benefits and all the rewards. And then the asset is specialised in nature. So if it's a specific asset that you are leasing that, say, only you can use due to its specialised nature, then only you have the risks and only you have the rewards. Again, from an exam perspective on the ACCA P2, what this lends itself here really well to is a discursive aspect within, say, question two or question three as to whether or not it should be a finance lease or whether or not it should be an operating lease because there's plenty of points to discuss there, isn't there? with regards to having the risks and rewards on the lessee. However, don't forget there could be computational aspects and the computational aspects with leases do tend to arise within question number one. That's where you tend to get the, the numbers that are crunched. However, do just be aware, I think in recent history, there was a question within question two whereby it asks you to look at a sale and lease back transaction, which we touch upon later. And as well as the discursive element, it also wanted you to throw in some computational aspect as well. So in question number one, it's purely computational, isn't it? In terms of question one, part A and the group accounts. Uh, so that focuses solely on the numbers. But as you move into question two or question three, there is that more discursive element and the possibility of a small level of numbers creeping in. So hopefully you're familiar now with what we have with regards to a finance lease and um, regards to what is an operating lease uh, and, and the criteria that determine whether it's a finance or an operating lease. Because what we're going to go through and do is in, in the next videos, first of all, if memory serves me right, we're going to go through and kick things off with regards to your operating leases. So looking at it from the lessees and then the lessors perspective. We will then go through there and think about the finance lease. So again, from the lessees perspective and then the lessors perspective. And then once you're happy and familiar with that, we'll then bring in your sale and lease back transaction. So there's a, a good considerable amount to go through and work with in the leases. But if you put the time and you put the effort in, any leases question that crops up within the exam should give you a little bit of a smile uh, that you can get across your face. See you later.